Harris. The physiognomy of the big bad wolf was said to have been founded upon Jed Harris. And so, hence the nose, which originally was very much bigger than it was finally in the film. And so with one or two extraneous externals, I began to build up a character, a characterization. I'm afraid I do work mostly from the outside in. I usually collect, whether consciously or unconsciously, I usually collect a lot of details, a lot of characteristics, and find a creature swimming about somehow in the middle of them. When you were playing Richard, was there a moment when you knew you were there, that all was set fair for your future? Well, I'd been on the stage now just 20 years. I'd just finished making Henry V. And I don't know how or why. I just went into it with the same distrust of the critics, the same fear of public opinion as I'd always experienced. I went onto the stage, frightened, heart beating, came on, locked the door behind me, approached the footlights and started. And I, I just simply went through it. I don't think anybody in the company believed in the project at all. I think everybody was rather in despair about the whole production. And nobody particularly believed in my performance. None of us particularly believed in any of our performances in it. And so I didn't know. I didn't know. I was just once more, once more going to have, as we say, a bash. I had developed this characterization. I've got a lot of things on my side. Now I come to think of it from the point of view of timeliness. One had Hitler over the way. Uh, one was playing it as a, a definitely as a paranoiac so that there was a core of something to which the audience would immediately respond. I fancy, I may be quite wrong, but I fancy to companion this idea, I sort of possibly filled it out, possibly enriched it a bit with a little more humor than, than I'd, I dare say a lot of other people had done. I'm not sure about that. But I only know that I, I read a few notices next morning, of course, drank a little bit too much. And uh, my next performance was the next day matinee, to which I was all too ill prepared. And there was something in the atmosphere. There was something, people talk, there is a phrase, the sweet smell of success. And I can only tell you, I've had two experiences of that, and it just smells like Brighton and oyster bars and things like that. As I walked onto the stage, I felt this thing. I felt for the first time that the critics had approved, that the public had approved, and they'd created a kind of grapevine, and that that particular audience had felt impelled to come to see me. And it was uh, an overwhelming feeling, a head reeling feel a feeling. And it went straight to my head. And uh, I felt a feeling I'd never felt before, this complete confidence. I felt, if you like, which is necessary for an actor to feel finally, I felt a little power of hypnotism. I felt that I had them. And it went to my head, as I said, to such an extent that I didn't even bother to put on the limp. <laughs> I thought, I've got them anyway. I needn't bother with all this characterization anymore. It's an awful story, really. In the 1945-6 season, there was Oedipus. And I can remember a very voluptuous notice that I wrote of that, in which I was trying to answer some of your critics at that time who were saying that you had tricks, you had vocal mannerisms and physical mannerisms. And I was saying that these tricks may exist, but that they were unique and only uh, you could pull them off. Do you think you have mannerisms? like not to think so, of course. I know I have, because I see them, and when they're pointed out, I feel them. Such as? Well, what are mannerisms? Mannerisms are cushions of protection which an actor develops against his own self-consciousness. 
uh, an actor comes onto the stage on a first night and does something, hangs his head or does something or other. And for that second, it's a comfort to him what he's done. It gives him a little moment of reality of this terrifying moment. And it goes in to the works. And in the future, if he's not very careful, he resorts to it on any first night. And those things collect and collect up. And you've got about 24, 37 things that you finally can't do without. Those are mannerisms. We're now going to see a scene from the unreleased film of the old Vic Othello. It's the scene in which, well, it's halfway through the great jealousy scene where Othello is really beginning to believe Iago's lies about Desdemona's infidelity with Cassio. Mm. False to me. To me! Oh, now, General, no more of that. Fault! Become! Thou hast set me on the rack. I swear it is better to be much abused than but to know it a little. Oh, no, my lord. What sense had I of her stolen hours of lust? I saw it not, thought it not, it harmed not me. I slept the next night well, was free and merry. I found not Cassio's kisses on her lips. He that is robbed not wanting what is stolen, let him not know it that he's not robbed at all. I am sorry to hear I've been happy if the general camp, pioneers and all, had tasted a sweet body, so I had nothing known. Oh. Now, forever, farewell, the tranquil mind. Farewell, content. Farewell, the plumed troops and the big wars that make ambition virtue. Oh, farewell. Farewell, the neighing steed and the shrill trump, the spirit-stirring drum, the ear-piercing fife, the royal banner and all quality, pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war. And oh, you mortal engines whose rude throats the immortal Jove's dread clamors counterfeit. Farewell, Othello's occupations. Done. Yes, Milan, be sure thou prove my love a whore. Be sure of it. Give me the ocular proof. Or by the worth of man's eternal soul, thou hast been better have been born a dog than a come I wait for. Come to this. Make me to see it. Or at least so prove it that the probation bear no hinge, no loops to hang it. Upon or woe upon my life! Never, never learn. If thou dost slander her and torture me, never pray more. Abandon all remorse. On horror's head, horrors accumulate. Do deeds to make heaven weep. All earth amazed. For nothing canst thou do damnation add greater than that. Uh, let's talk about Othello a little bit. At the beginning, you were very reluctant to play the part at all. Why was that? Well, I knew it was a. I knew it was a terror. I knew from past experience that it was almost impossible. When I was on tour in Europe one time, I was doing uh, Titus Andronicus and Antony Quayle was playing Aaron. And we had uh, a little interval together. And one day he said to me, is this a very bad one for you, this Titus Andronicus? And I said, mm, yes, awful, awful. I said, but you've played Macbeth too. You, I think you'd agree that Macbeth is the worst. And he said, you haven't done the black one yet, have you? And I said, no. Why is that terrible? He said, terrible. The most difficult ones to bear are the ones that are complaining all the time. The ones that moan. Macbeth is all right because he's positive. He said, but you know what you hate about Titus. He's always going, ooh, ooh, oh, look at, ooh, fancy them doing that to me. Oh, 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 and how? many ways are that of saying oh oh and it's very tough on your imagination it's very tough on your resourcefulness of variations of all kinds and therefore it's and it's also a very great strain physically he said Othello was all of that and you have to black up as well <laughs> uh, when you came to play Othello yourself did you feel physically equipped for it in every respect no I didn't that was another thing that had troubled me I didn't think that I had the voice for it I've just, listening to that excerpt, I, I wouldn't say I had yet either. But I did go through a, through a, a long period of um, vocal training, especially for it to increase the depth, the deep registers of my voice. And I did actually manage to attain about six more notes in the bass. And the, um, from the physical point of view, I, I went through, and I still do, a, um, a very 
se vie.